Uh, this one was another one that uh, it was chosen totally at random. I thought it would be uh, rather interesting to explore the... Because um, it would have been easy to probably do, like, just kiss the girls in a long game of Spider and compare the Freeman versions of the Alex Cross adaptations, but... I figured why not go ahead and compare the actors while we were at it, so I decided on this and the reboot from 2012 uh, with just his name being the title. Um, and obviously A Long Game of Spider and Kiss the Girls were like actual book adaptations, whereas Alex Cross is like a whole sort of combination of stuff, which we'll get to when we get there. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much what that is. So we're going to probably start with Kiss the Girls. Um, <clears throat> well, I did also want to mention, it's also quite interesting when you look up, I wasn't quite sure until I looked it up just how many Alex Cross books there are. I'm still not quite sure of the exact number, but it's like around 20, right? Um, and so it's like, it's actually kind of miraculous in a way that we only have three movies uh, based on that. So... Going into that, where unless you count Alex Cross as like multiple adaptations, but um, starting with Kiss of the Girls, the interesting thing about this is that if you're not familiar with the source material, which I'm not really, I, I read like half of I, Alex Cross like a really long time ago, and I don't even remember how that happened, but um, being only familiar with the character pretty much through these movies, um, and you just sort of think it's sort of a typical crime thing. But when Kiss the Girls begins, uh, if you're not quite familiar with, like, what you're getting into, you might think you're looking at a horror movie, because this opening sequence, uh, with the opening credits is actually kind of terrifying. Where we have, um, this voice narrating, who I'm guessing we're supposed to assume is Tony Goldwyn, um, basically telling us about this scenario in, like, 1975, where he would watch these women who he claimed to have fallen in love with, um, despite the fact that they're young, sometimes very young, um, and will sometimes get their mothers involved in this as well, uh, and talks about basically watching them sleep from the attic for, like, months, um, and basically saying that they loved him too, they just didn't know it, and then the way that he pounced, and the fact that we're seeing this, it's being told to us as, like, a love story from this serial killer's perspective. Uh, and it's, that is such a crazy opening for such, like, a generic crime movie. <laughs> um, it sort of sets you up, like, even if it is a generic crime movie, maybe it'll have, like, sort of, like, something in this genre we don't really see very often. Um, and so that's intriguing, like, instantly. And the way that this is a character that just seems to, like, know everything, like, in this really weird way, like, even in the moments when, uh, like, when he talks about, you know, just watching them from places that they somehow have no idea that he's in, like, he can just move around like a ghost, practically, when he watches people, and then that point kind of comes to a head when, uh, we get, like, Ashley Judd's whole backstory for a while, where we see her, like, you know, as a doctor at the hospital, and then she goes to, like, her kickboxing kickboxing classes with Billy Blanks and stuff like that. Um, and she goes to a sauna and all that, and just sort of lives her life until she's eventually taken in her house. Um, and even though there has been no sign whatsoever of her being targeted, pretty much until she's taken, there's just that one line when he has her and he says, uh, don't try any of that kick, kickboxing stuff on me or something like that. And it's like that just one line tells you like, how long has she been getting watched, and, like, where was he in those moments that we even saw? Um, and there's just something really kind of cool and creepy about that. Um, like I said, sort of sets him apart from the typical antagonist you would get in, you know, movies like this or stories like this. Villains kind of like Picasso and like, Alex Ross, that sort of generic. Um, it does feel like it actually kind of goes beyond that as far as villains go, but another thing that just totally sort of rises, I guess the girls, from other of those generic thrillers is uh, the presence of Morgan Freeman. And sure, outside of Alex Ross, Morgan Freeman's been his fair share of, like, generic thrillers, but his portrayal of this character in particular kind of really stands out in an interesting way to where he's 
Well, he's got that authoritative way about him that we just know, uh, but in that sort of way that Freeman just has that way of like seeming like he has everything, everything is good in his hands, and like we'll be fine. Um, and they do this clever enough introduction of him where he has to talk this woman who's just killed her husband out of, uh, talk her out of committing suicide. And the way he sort of starts this off with the, he, she's got the gun in her mouth, and the first thing he says is, he's trying to get her to talk, so the first thing he says is, it, you know, it's just as effective if you put it to your head. And <laughs> so he doesn't really try to talk her completely out of doing it right away, but just the fact that he basically allows her to continue to threaten suicide while they have this conversation. Um, there's just, like, something so confidently in control in regards to that, so... Um, and that's just his intro. Like, there's... It's... Obviously, it's called back later in the very end in the kitchen with Gary Ellis, but prior to that, um, we just kind of... We set that up, but then his character just kind of goes on, and it's a whole different kind of version of that as it goes on. Um, and then we've got, like... And just the way he's sort of... Got, like, even when he's learned that his niece is one of the girls that has been taken, and he's talking to her mother... Um, an uncredited Anna Maria Horsford, interestingly enough. And the way he talks to her to, like, calm her down. Um, after somebody in his family has been taken, this is a family member, he still kind of has, like, that sort of negotiating way about him, uh, with just the way he talks to them. But there's not, like... You don't even get that sense that it's, like, him bringing work home or anything like that. Um, or, like, he's so obsessed with his job or anything like that. It's just... That's kind of just the character, that's just the way he is. He can do that at his job or at home with his family, and it has the same effect and doesn't feel like necessarily one's bleeding into the other. Um, he just kind of has that sort of cool control over everything, whether it be his personal life or his work life. Um, and that's just brought brilliantly to life by what Freeman's doing here. Um, and even, you don't even really buy it when, like, he's not the authority figure. Like, um, when they're, after they found the first body tied to the tree, and Brian Cox is the one in charge, and he comes in and he says, uh, like, you know, you're my guest, make yourself at home, but don't mess around in the kitchen. Um, and you can see Freeman kind of, like, not even buy that. Uh, it's like, no, I'm, I'm gonna fuck your kitchen right up, but I, I respect what you do, I respect your position, but this kitchen's gonna get all fucked up, sorry. Um, and just the way that he can go into things like, um, like it's, you keep, you probably, like if you're pedantic enough, you'd probably watch Kiss the Girls and just constantly say, you know, Alex Cross, you could call in backup. Uh, it's like, he, he, he explains why he doesn't bring the FBI in and stuff like that, but even so, it's like, at some point in time, in many of the scenarios in this movie, you'd think he'd want somebody to have his back, but he just goes like one man just into anything <laughs> um and that would probably be like annoying and contrived for any other movie but with the way freeman has established this character and how he's gonna play him it's pretty easy to just go along with and it's like yeah, he'll be fine uh so, so we're good. he might get hit by a car but uh he'll be fine in the next scene it doesn't matter uh he'll wince a little bit when ashley judd touches him and the parts he got hit in but he's fine uh he'll get right back up and speaking of ashley judd um, obviously she's our other main character, the character that gets taken, as I said, by, um, Casanova, or one of a couple, <laughs> and, um, she eventually escapes, and then she's the witness that is dragged around everywhere in potentially an unrealistic way, but it's a movie, she's a witness, she's actually Judd, so she's gonna always be present. So, um, and the thing about Ashley Judd here and what she has to do here is, just kind of in general, I find Ashley Judd as an actress pretty comparable to Maria Bello, where if somebody asks me if she's a good actress, my response is, I think so? <laughs> because what Ashley Judd seems to have here, um, similarly to Maria Bello, is that, I mean, she, yes, she is a very good actress, um, especially when things are sort of more downplayed, um, and when she's just basically got dialogue to work with, or she has to, you know, express something s more or less low-key, um, great, um, but she really likes to gamble when she's gonna go big, like, when she goes big, she's gonna go big, whether 
seemingly whether she's prepared for it or not. Um, and yeah, some of these things where she has to get like really big and really loud can be questionable. It's sort of like it's sort of like when you watch her in Bug, and you're not sure if it's one of the worst performances you've ever seen or one of the best. Uh, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, I th I love her in Bug, but it's yeah, she's really taking a gamble <laughs> in regards to where she goes. And there's many scenes in similar to that in this. Um, like, I have a hard time buying her in the scenes when she's actually imprisoned and trying to communicate with the others. But I think that whole scene is a bit sort of clunky because I've always kind of thought, and I know it would take, like, a lot, like, out of the movie, but I do think the movie is too long, and I think something that I think really could have helped is if uh, the movie, like, when we were introduced to Ashley Judd's character would be, like, maybe if not after the escape, at least during the escape. Uh, like, you know how we get the scene with, what was, Megan, I think was the first victim's name that he took out and they found? Um, if that scene had been replaced with uh, Ashley Judd running through the woods, making her escape, and then jumping into the water and all that, and if that was, like, her introduction, um, and then what we learn about what happened when she was in prison, where she communicated and she knows that his niece is there and all that, if it was just kind of said in dialogue, because, like, really think about that. Like, if you, if she were to just explain without us seeing, like, the first time we're ever introduced to her, she has seen some shit, and she's frightened for her life, running through the woods, and is so terrified of this guy, she's going to jump into the water and potentially die. Luckily she doesn't, but still. And then she's explaining to us, I was in this place, and I could hear their voices. I could hear all the voices. They were all calling out to me, and... I heard, you know, her voice, and they didn't know, like, how long they'd even been there. And it's like, there's, you, your imagination can just sort of take off with that and imagine what her perspective must have been like. When we actually see it, though, it's just so... it's just there. <laughs> it doesn't really feel like anything. There's nothing particularly scary about it or, you know, suspenseful about it or, like, something that just really makes your heart sink. Uh, it's just like these bodiless voices calling out with these actresses that can't deliver their lines very well. The one, the one poor girl that says like, "What month is it?" It's just, it just doesn't really work uh, for me anyway. So um, I, w I feel like you would shave off a lot of time if it's you know like when they say like they mention at least once she works at the hospital. They mention at least once that she takes kickboxing classes. And then there's the point in time when somebody says, you know, like, she's a fighter. And it's like, as, as, you know, simple as it sounds, that's probably all we would have needed. We wouldn't need, like, 15 minutes of movie time devoted to just her doing that stuff. Uh, and that sort of clunky imprisonment scene. We could have done away with all of that, and it probably would have set up the layer where they're being kept in a much more sort of sinister way. But... As is, we do have that. And in regards to also the movie being a bit too long, it is a bit weird how much it sort of, like, takes its time in some scenes when it it's, like, really unnecessary. It's, like, about... Like, there are plenty of scenes where this movie could take its time, um, but it actually gets surprisingly rushed in the wrong areas, and it takes its time in the wrong areas. Uh, like, when they're putting pieces together, these are things that should be, like, being slowly figured out. Um, but it's just that whole 90s thriller contrivance thing where it just takes, like, one thing and Freeman can figure it out. Like, Freeman sees one signature or whatever and can match it to this thing, just seeing it by coincidence and all that. Um, but then you have scenes, like, when he's gonna question people. So he goes to the basketball court and he questions that guy. But before he questions that guy, we get, like, a whole scene of these people playing basketball. And then Freeman shows up and questions the guy. And then, uh, Dr. Sex, when we first meet him at the, uh, swimming thing, the race, and there's, like, a scene devoted to him and some dude we never see again, and they're trash-talking each other, and then they swim and they race. And then Freeman shows up, and it's like, why did we get such lengthy introductions to what these people he was questioning were doing? Because it didn't have anything to do with anything at all. 
Uh, so I that that was weird to me. It's always been weird to me, but. Um, yeah, it's easy to see when you look at stuff like that, like how the movie got to over length. So, it's stuff that's really easily fixable, so that's, that's just that. Um, and then we look at, um, who our villains end up being. There is Tony Goldwyn, obviously, um, and the big whole reveal, which, obviously, if you're watching this, I would hope you know how Kiss the Girls ends, so I'm just gonna go ahead and say this. Obviously, our other killer, because there's two, because this was the year after Scream, uh, <laughs> I think. I think it's 97. Um, so they And they actually do set that up in a particular way to where, like, maybe if it hadn't come out after Scream, it would be more surprising. But it's like when you already have that fresh in your brain from just the year before, and you think, oh, well, there are two killers on each coast. And it's like, is this dude really doing this... I, I, there's, it's just impossible. There's no possible way. It's, and it's like really late in the movie too when Cross is like, this has to be two people. And it's like, no fucking shit. <laughs> but, whatever. Um, and Alex Cross, he figures things out a bit too quickly, and sometimes in this too, so it's like, okay, you can, I guess, be slow at this point, if, whatever, if it makes the pacing better. Um, so obviously with Carrie Ellis being the, uh, second killer, they do, well, the main one, really, um, they do do something that actually is quite clever, that you almost, it's something you, like, almost give the movie shit for until you realize what they're doing. Uh, the whole accent thing, where it's, <laughs> where one of the things that really stuck out when you first start watching it is Carrie Ellis' th southern accent. And you're like, well, that's just, that, it's just not Carrie Ellis at all. <laughs> so, um, you spend the whole movie saying, like, God, Carrie Ellis is terrible in this. He can't do that accent for shit. Why is he doing that accent? Why is this character like this? Um, and then the big reveal where it's like, it's part of his, it's his disguise. Uh, because it's like you're hearing the voice of Casanova through the whole movie. Even in, once we realize that Tony Goldwyn is working with somebody else. Uh, we realize it's not just his voice we're hearing, and who's the person you're not thinking of, the person with the really obvious accent. <laughs> um, unless it occurs to you and you're like, that accent is so bad, he must be faking. Uh, if you, <laughs> then you figured it out pretty quickly. But um, I do think it's actually kind of cool. I do think it may have worked better if you got an actor where, like, instead of the actor doing a voice that's not his for this the whole disguise of it all, um, and it was them doing, instead of it being his normal voice for the killer identity, if those were, like, switched, um, I think you'd probably have a better time, but, <laughs> um, and I, I do think it's a decent idea to, to kind of, you know, hide that, and they do throw those little things in there to where, like, if you, obviously if you're watching and you already know how it ends, you're kind of looking for those little clues, and there are a couple of things in there, like one right after the other, in that scene when uh, Cross gets the letter like addressed directly to him. And the first thing Carrie always says is, oh, I admire his penmanship, or something like that. And, um, and then like right after that, he does this thing where it seems to be, when you're watching it again, you realize it's probably a character trait, when uh, they're talking about what it says in the letter, and the word um, odalisk is used. And he acts like that he's confusing it with uh, obelisk, and J.O. Sanders has to correct him. And it's like, that's that's sort of a clever way to sort of hide that you totally know what that word means um, <laughs> when you're at the actual crime scene. But, um, yeah, it is still one of those cases, though, where it's like, it is a contrived 90s thriller, and it is pretty easy to figure out. I remember I was probably 11 or 12 or something when I first saw this, and uh, I, I fucking knew it was Gary because I think most people did, because it's that thing where, maybe this is after you've watched too many movies, but it's like, and maybe there are some times where this won't exactly line up this way, but nine times out of ten it does. And that's just by watching the opening credits, because you've got, um, the credits go Morgan Freeman, Ashley Judd, Carrie Elwes, he's third. So the thing is, is it's like, you watch the whole movie, and he, he might as well be barely there. Uh, and it's like, there's there's no reason that they got an actor that recognizable to play this random detective dude that's really just standing around with all the other detectives. And it's one of those things where it's like, if you were to look at Ruskin, I think is his name, if you were to have him in the movie and you took out the 90 seconds where it's revealed he's the killer, 
uh, and you recast him, that actor probably wouldn't even make the opening credits because the character just seems that insignificant. Uh, it just seems like he's just grouped in with all the others. But it's like, because it's an actor you recognize, because he's third in the credits, you, you just kind of get that vibe that he's more important than that. Uh, and that tends to be the dead giveaway. Sometimes I'd use that way of thinking and I've been wrong, but most of the time it's just easy. It, it's that easy. So, um, so that's a little unfortunate, but it's still, it's still kind of, the I still kind of like the climax of the movie pretty well. Um, when it is revealed that it's him, uh, and just the way that scene plays out and the way she slowly figures it out and the way he like just kind of goes out of his accent and like, that's like the full on reveal. I do, I do actually like that a lot. So, um, and there is, you know, there are some individual scenes in the movie that work quite well. Like, I really like the interrogation scene with Sax, where it seems like he's revealing himself. And it, it is, like, watered down by the fact that they do that whole... Con he's just a contrived patsy thing. Uh, the, the movie gets way overcomplicated uh, when it really doesn't need to be, which... Like, it, but it is... I do really like the concept, though, of the whole... Um, it's, it really takes an extreme for him to kill one of his victims in the way that they're all just kind of assumed dead when they're taken, but it's they're actually all still alive, and he just, like, collects them and makes them, like... They, he makes, like, this makeshift orchestra out of them. It is... There's definitely some really good ideas in this that make for a really cool thriller, but it does, like, fall short in a lot of places, too. Just mainly through, you know, regular genre contrivances and stuff like that that really don't differ from anything else you'd see in this area, but, um, there is definitely some stuff to like in here, but of course, the main standout is the way Freeman at the center of this is just so, you know, just solid right here in the center and knows exactly how to make this character so interesting without just making him another cop that figures everything out. Um, he really brought sort of another layer to that with his just sort of, you know, Morgan Freeman authoritative awesomeness, so, um, yeah, and actually, weirdly enough, as seemingly disliked as it seems to be, I think I may prefer Along Came a Spider. Along Came a Spider has actually kind of, like, been a guilty pleasure for a while. I actually, it was probably just a little under a year ago that I actually rewatched Along Came a Spider <laughs> for some reason. I don't know. It's actually right down here on this shelf. Um, but, yeah, so... But we're going to skip over A Long Game of Spider to go to the reboot, uh, Alex Cross, starring the unexpected casting choice of Tyler Perry. Um, so, as I said, there was a lot of confusion about where this story came from, because for the longest time, I had heard it was going to be based on I, Alex Cross, and then the actual credit in the movie says it's based on Cross, um, but then research tells me that even that's barely true. Uh, and it's like, because they took, like, uh, elements from a bunch of different stories, and I guess, like, the chronological order is, like, all messed up. Um, how it's like, because it does almost play off, like, sort of a prequel to Kiss the Girls, Along Came a Spider. And I, I think, to my understanding, I think Along Came a Spider actually came before Kiss the Girls, book-wise. So we're all kind of fucked up anyway. <laughs> um, so this is this is just bizarre. It's like, you'd think they definitely would have adapted more with a series this big, um, but when they do adapt it, it's just all out of whack. It's This is weird in regards to book adaptations, but um, also kind of refreshing, too, so there is that. But yeah, we are basically doing the whole reboot scenario, which pretty much says they can do whatever they want, but like I said, it does sort of have a prequel vibe because everybody's a bit younger. Janelle, who was played by Tatiana Ali, who was Ashley on Fresh Prince, and Kiss the Girls is now, like, a little girl in Alex Cross. Um, just stuff like that. And, interestingly enough, I was reading that, despite the fact that everybody looks at Morgan Freeman's portrayal as, like, this sort of great definitive thing, um, Patterson himself actually said that, like, he, he, he was, like, a huge fan of Freeman's portrayal but went on to say that Tyler Perry is kind of how he, like, like physically and how he comes off in the movie is, like, how he had initially envisioned the character, uh, which is 
very interesting. <laughs> so, going on that, and this was, like, his first, I think it was actually his first starring role outside of a, uh, not just one of his own movies, but, like, a Medea movie in particular, I think. Because, um, obviously, he, he had, like, cameos in, like, Star Trek, but, I mean, as far as, like, being front and center, um, this was, like, a first outside of his own movies. So, as he continues, um, or begins, whatever part of the timeline you're looking at, um, we immediately do something very different from Kiss the Girls. Um, where Kiss the Girls had, did, took the whole approach of having the villain shrouded in mystery, and it was going to be one of those reveal things, and he was always, hi always hiding his face, and we only ever saw him when he was doing the sinister shit. Um, Matthew Fox's villain in Alex Cross is a big focus. We get to see a lot of the stuff that he does. Um, and it's <laughs> this really interesting sort of, like, progressive thing, like, throughout as we go in regards to who this guy is, because when we first meet him, he looks a little intense, because he's Matthew Fox, he's, like, lost a lot of weight, he's shaved his head, and he just has this over-the-top intense look on his face. Not one of Matthew Fox's better performances, by the way. Uh, he went he went maybe a little too far in the, the psychotic tick thing, but, um, like, to a laughable degree, but um, the thing here is, when we first meet him, he's wearing a suit, and he just looks like a dude that's, you know, going to a business meeting or whatever. But this business meeting turns out to be this, like, underground cage fight. So he goes up, and he makes a bet. And it's like, okay, so he's that guy. Um, well, it turns out he's one of the fighters, and he's ripped, and his name is The Butcher. <laughs> so now he's this cage fighter, as opposed to this business dude. And then not only does he beat this dude's ass after being underestimated, um, just as an extra fuck you, he breaks the dude's arm after he's beaten him, which we also obviously learned that his whole thing is he's, you know, this big sort of sadist everything, you know, everything, like, I'm obsessed with pain, like, everything is pain to me, like, that is my life. Um, and then, once that is established, um, he takes the girl back to her place, and now he's like this seducer type. This very sort of smooth, almost Bond-like seducer. Um, and then very quickly we learn, serial killer. Uh, it's like, business dude, relentless cage fighter, man of seduction, serial killer. Uh, just all in like one unbroken stay with Matthew Fox's character. We just watch him go from scene to scene without cutting back to anything else. Um, very interesting intro to this character. Um, and yeah, as I was talking about, um, I do think Alex Cross in this particular case may have an upper hand on Kiss the Girls, because I know, um, you, you sort of get that vibe in Kiss the Girls that, um, not only are they keeping the killer, like, shrouded in mystery, and we only ever really see the aftermath, we don't really see him doing it much. Um, with the casting of Freeman, it does sort of feel like they wanted they wanted to try to kind of recreate the, the Seven vibe a little bit. Um, but I think there is a lot to be had uh, in a positive way uh, by really letting your villain show off. Like, really show his face, really show what he does, even see, show what he's doing when he's not killing people. <laughs> um, once, not that Picasso is, like, the best representation of that, um, but I, I, it, it can really elevate your movie if you make the killer a really interesting character and make him a character that you, like, show and explore just as much as you explore the hero. Um, so I, so I do really like that. And even, like, the scene when, um, like, when he's, like, cutting her fingers off, and it's like, you don't really expect them to be, like, you know, showing it that much. And it's also kind of weird that, like, they seem to show a lot more of what the killer does in this, despite the fact that, um... Alex Ross, I believe, is PG-13, and Kiss the Girls was the R-rated one, <laughs> weirdly enough. But um, Alex Ross seemed to really go for it more in regards to the villains. Um, okay, so this is... It's, it, yeah, you gotta, gotta go back and forth, because I really like the way they really showed off the villain Alex Ross, but clearly Kiss the Girls had the much more interesting villain, for sure. But, like I said, I like that Alex Cross took the approach of let's at least show the villain off uh, and really let him have a lot of screen time so we can play with that. But, like I said, um, not one of Matthew Fox's best performances, so it's 
there's an uneven balance here in regards to that, but, um, and then, um, and he's also one of those guys, like, has to, maybe they show him off, they show him off nicely, but probably in the wrong ways. I think that's the issue, because we already had the scene at the cage fight where he was underestimated, and then he fucked a dude up, uh, which is a cliche in itself, but they did it again in a much more contrived way when he's on the train, <laughs> in this hilar unintentionally hilarious sequence. When he's just standing there, just waiting for the train, like a normal dude, he's got a hat, he's got a bag and all that, he's just there waiting. And just because he has to do villainy things, we have to have three dudes walk up, three fucks that come up and say, like, Hey, hey dude, do you, are your panties in there? Are you, like, they call him, like, Panty Man? They're just trying to antagonize him for no damn reason. And it's just, and then the, the best part of this... The best part of this is when they actually get on the train and they start to realize that something's about to go down and that this dude's not to be trusted. So they decide to attack, but when they catch him, they say, Oh my god, he's a terrorist. We gotta take him out. <laughs> Those are the actual words they say to each other. He's a terrorist. We gotta take him out. <laughs> just for him to turn and shoot them dead. Um, and like they, they were that worthless. They were there just to antagonize him and to let us getting to see him kill more people. It's like I said, good thing they want to show the villain off. That's a good start. The way they do it is not the way to go. So <laughs> uh, let's make that perfectly clear. It's not surprising at all to learn that um, the director who I didn't mention on Kiss the Girls is a guy named Gary Fleeter who did some pretty mainstream movies like Runaway Jury and something else that I'm forgetting. But, um, and then he did, like, Don't Say a Word with Michael Douglas, which got a little dark for a mainstream thriller, but he also did an amazing movie called Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead, uh, which is, like, this really over-the-top thing. The characters in it are, like, almost like comic book characters, and it's this really cool crime movie. And you can get a sense that a director made Kiss the Girls that was, was stuck with making a mainstream, you know, cliché thriller. But there, he still tried to take some interesting ways about that. Um, the director of Alex Cross is Rob Cohen, the guy that did the first Fast and Furious movie in Triple X. You can see the difference. You can really, really see the difference. Um, and not to say that, you know, Kiss the Girls was flawlessly directed. It had, like, those moments when, uh, when he's chasing Tony Goldwyn through the woods and we're doing, like, the the jerky editing where like it makes a whoosh sound every time it cuts you know that's dumb but Rob Cohen has not only taken the approach of being like a flashy action movie while also being like totally generic and boring in regards to the aesthetic um, but he's also doing that thing I talked the most recent movie I talked about it with was Peppermint but I feel like I'm talking about it all the damn time with these poorly directed action movies and that's the um, the shaky, distorted thing when somebody's doing something real intense that's supposed to heighten it or whatever. Uh, Matthew Fox gets that a lot when he just, like, turns his head and shit. Or when it's, like, it's supposed to show, like, when he's, like, snapping or, like, when he has crazies coming out or something, and it's it's bad. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the only way I can put that. It's um, Like I said, I just really don't, you know, go for that, but... On top of that, it does also have um, the kind of shitty dialogue you'd expect. Like, not just, like, characters just saying lazy shortcuts so that the scene can move on or they can figure something out without the screenplay having to try to be smart. Um, but they also have stuff like um, when uh, Edward Burns just gets the call and he's been interrupted while he's with Rachel Nichols and he's putting his pants on and her response is, uh, I know something's wrong because you're putting your pants on angrily. <sighs> Lines like that, uh, you have to get through, but, um, yeah, but I will give it credit for one thing in regards to a decision they made, and that is that, um, and maybe not necessarily, you know, n now, like, maybe it was just the frame of mind I was in, but when we saw this in theaters, um, me, Owen, and my brother saw this in theaters back in 2012 when it first came out. I was genuinely surprised when his wife was killed by Matthew Fox. Uh, it's like, but the thing, I mean, obviously you look back on it and you think like, uh, oh, she was pregnant. And then you had like the scene devoted to him just going to his mom and saying like, 
I'm just really happy. I'm just so happy. But the interesting thing about that that Tyler Perry pulled off was that I feel like that moment when he's genuinely happy um, was so authentically played by him was that I didn't really think about it being this sort of like being for no other purpose than to be a payoff later for her to be killed so that it's sad and motivating. Um, I feel like he actually played the scene so well and the scene just kind of naturally sort of happens between him and Carmen and Jogo plays his wife who is also incredibly talented so it makes sense um, but it's yeah I kind of let that slip out I just called Tyler Perry incredibly talented despite the fact that I despise the Medea movies but he's definitely he's got something he definitely does have something like whether whether we like it or not um, he can do what he does and even when he goes outside of that, as we saw in, like, Gone Girl, um, Tyler Perry can do this. And, like I said, in moments like this, I totally, I totally believe it. Um, and, like I said, it made me not even think, this is leading to a total cliché. Uh, <laughs> it actually was able to catch me off guard when it happened the first time. Like I said, it could have also caught me in the wrong frame of mind, where I just wasn't just thinking ahead in general. But, yeah, I was caught by surprise when that happened. Not so much... Uh, the other time we have like a whole vengeful thing where um, the Rachel Nichols character is killed because that is like that's like the companion to that throughout the movie is this really really underdeveloped pointless thing between Edward Burns and her character uh, and it's just sort of plays up even more like I almost forget that that scene even happens uh, that that character even not only is even in the movie but dies too uh, and Edward Burns is kind of supposed to be motivated but not really. That could be because I think Edward Burns is a terrible actor. But uh, that's just me. Um, a decent writer-director, a uh, terrible actor. But, um... So yeah, like, you could really take those characters out. But I do kind of get that sense where it does sort of play nicely into Kiss the Girls. And the like. Like, if you're looking at it, like, if you take the source material out and you're specifically thinking of just the movies... And you want to say that, like, talking about the fucked up order of Long Came and Spider and Kiss the Girls, if you just imagine this flowing right into Kiss the Girls, it is nice to see how, I was saying, like, he always just goes into things alone, um, without backup or calling anybody or anything, no matter how much trouble it could get him into. Um, it is interesting to see, like, a sort of change there where we see that he has a partner, uh, that he seems relatively close to in Alex Cross, and then we see the way that. He's still very much uh, a family man in uh, Kiss the Girls, even if it's not as direct as, say, a wife or another child or something. Um, but it does sort of also show the why it would mean so much that a family member, like a niece, were taken. Um, so that's because you get sort of like even the last shot of the movie is like just him and his mom staring at each other. <laughs> so it's like, hey, you know, family's great. Uh, it is Rob Cohen who made the Fast and Furious movies. You know they're all about family, so... Um, and, yeah, and obviously, as I've been talking about sort of gradually, um, while the movie isn't great, um, these scenes are backed up by a really surprisingly talented lineup. Like, this revolving door of talent just keeps coming and going. Because, like I said, Carmen Jago plays his wife. we got Cicely Tyson as his mom. John C. McGinley comes in and out as the captain. Um, Jean Reno has a major part. Uh, he seems kind of throwaway for a while there, but then contrives after contrivance later. He's the guy that hired Matthew Fox, etc. Um, and Giancarlo Esposito eventually shows up as well. Like I said, um, they're pretty wasted, and the movie has way too many characters. But as long as they're talent, um, it does feel like it keeps the movie rolling at least. So there is that. Like, you can say, oh, Giancarlo Esposito, that's great. Oh, John C. McGinley, awesome. Oh, Jean Reno, great. Uh, it's like that that's enough to keep you looking at the movie <laughs> even when it's like at its shittiest um so that's good and then but yeah the really interesting thing though talk when i was talking about the character progression of alex cross in general if you're just looking at the movies is um the whole how it turns into a revenge plot and it is like um i don't know if the alex cross fan base and the bond fan base intersect but um the, the idea I was thinking was if the Alex Cross movies were the Bond movies, Alex Cross would be licensed to kill. Because we actually get to see this character that usually just goes from assignment to assignment. We actually get to see it get... We saw it get personal and kiss the girls, but we get it to get it so personal that it's 
basically a revenge movie, like, at its core. Um, and we get to see that how this character reacts to that, and like I said, it does almost work as sort of a backstory, if you want to say, you can look at it as coming before the Freeman movies if you want. Um, so, but even with that being an interesting approach to take, like, on paper, um, the execution's not really there, because like I said, it gets overcomplicated, it has too many characters, there's too many links that it takes to get to a place that we could have just had, like, one link, if that, um, like, but like I said, even though it does also tend to move fast, because it is one of those things where the writers get lazy and decide to just make Alex Cross know everything, uh, so like, as soon as he arrives on the scene, he just knows everything. Um, and it's like, I get the idea of that to make him seem like, uh, he's, like, un unstoppable in a way, and, like, he's just that good, which would make an intriguing lead, but, uh, you kind of gotta have, like, you know, the smarts to back that up. Like, you kind of gotta be, as the writer, you've gotta be on the same page as him. If this is gonna work, you can't just say, oh, he knows everything. That's my job. <laughs> so, that's... But overall, um, there is that. So it does rely on those contrivances and stuff like that. Um, and it eventually also gets very anticlimactic for being such a revenge-driven movie. Um, it's one of those cases where, like, you feel like you're watching the mid-action scene, and then the mid-action scene just goes right into the climax, and you're like, oh, okay, I guess we're done. <laughs> it's like, well, they didn't want to think anymore. It's okay. Um, and really... Despite the fact that it has a scene that was initially as surprising to me as his wife being killed, much as I should have seen it coming, um, there's a big lack of suspense in the whole movie. Like, I think the most suspenseful scene in the movie is probably after Matthew Fox is already dead. It's when he, after he's dropped and uh, Cross is just hanging there, and Edward Burns has to hang on until they pull him up, and it's like, that's not even really played up as suspenseful. It's just them waiting for the cops to show up. And it's like, we know Cross isn't going to fall to his death, so it doesn't matter. Um, and it's really just... Yeah, there's really nothing like that at all. There's not even a scene like where we know how it's going to turn out like when, um, at the end, when after Carrie Ellis is revealed to be the killer and Cross has to race to Ashley Judd's house. It's like, there's still something pretty suspenseful about that, despite the fact that we know where it's going. There's, like, nothing like that in Alex Ross. Um, it just kind of goes from scene to scene. Um, the most suspense is really just, just how crazy is the next thing that Matthew Fox does is going to be. I don't know. but um, So yeah, well, Kiss the Girls is definitely not the perfect thriller. Um, it's 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 all right enough, especially when you compare it to Alex Cross, which I don't think completely deserved the critical beating that it took. Um, and the added humiliation that it didn't make very much money. I don't. I don't think it made its like, even its initial budget back. Like even when you just look at like the base, the most basic of the numbers, and don't do all the different calculating. I think even then, just by basic numbers, it didn't make its budget back. So, um, that's that's a bit unfortunate. But it does make you wonder if they're gonna try, the movie adaptation of Alex Cross again at some point. They've got plenty of source material to work with. I don't know the you know, measures of quality on those, but, um, I don't know, but they could do, like, there was something that could have been done, like, about the idea of just sort of kind of taking the outlines of certain stories from the source material and doing their own thing. Um, there is something about that that probably could have worked if you don't get, you know, crowds that are too, you know, attached to the source material, but... I don't know, but I'm saying this once again as somebody that has not read source material except maybe a little bit, so that's just where I'm coming from. So, obviously I would take Kiss the Girls over Alex Cross, but, yeah. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I think I may prefer a long game spider over all of them. So, um, that's what we have here. Uh, next, we're going to... I'm going to get into the horror vein like a week early, because I'm not actually starting the horror theme until, uh, like the following week, but the next one's going to basically be in that theme anyway, so we're pretty much starting October like a day early, so who's complaining? <laughs> so uh, until that...